Well, we're in 1 Samuel, session 2, and I'll call it the session of the lost ark, because the Ark of the Covenant gets captured with what has to be, at least in my opinion, <laughs> one of the most amusing um, episodes in the entire Bible. You'll see what I'm getting at in a minute. Just again to put it in context, as we look at, ti- at a timeline between the creation and Genesis and so forth, Genesis covering it all the way up to the Exodus, uh, then... Uh, the nation Israel, of course, from Exodus, say, to Christ. Uh, the rest of the Old Testament covering that period. They, they, they say there's 400 silent years between the Testaments. That's sort of a misnomer because those years are written down in advance in Daniel 11. But then, of course, um, the New Testament occurs in one lifetime. What we're doing, of course, is we're focusing, after the book of Judges, on the beginning of the monarchy. And uh, after this session, we'll be talking, of course, we've always introduced Samuel last time, and we're going to be dealing with Saul next time. So we'll be going to Saul, David, and, and the, the monarchy as we go. Another way to look at this is that the book of First Samuel takes us up through the life of Saul. Second Samuel will give us the life of David. First Kings will take us from Solomon to uh, well into the divided kingdom, and Second Kings all the way to the exile. First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings are called in the Septuagint, First, Second, Third, and Fourth Kings, and some Bibles have that kind of nomenclature, but it's more common to speak of, you know, First, Second Samuel, First, Second Kings. First and Second Kings will split uh, between Elijah and Elisha, and so on, but First and Second Chronicles will parallel Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, but from the point of view of the Southern Kingdom, the one that endures, the one through whom the Messiah will uh, be coming. So that's a quick perspective. First and Second Samuel, of course, deals with three key people: Samuel, Saul, and David. First and Second Kings will carry us, you know, through David, Saul, and the divided kingdom all the way to the exile, uh, Assyria for the northern kingdom, where it gets wiped out, and Babylon, where they're captive, but they come back from, uh, and so on. So, okay, and the First Second Chronicles, I say, recaps that from the point of view of, of the southern kingdom. First Book of Samuel, and uh, we, last time we talked about Samuel, his birth and youth, his call and his office. And we're going to talk this time and a little bit next time about some of the early years before Saul. But then we'll get to Saul in chapter 8 of Samuel and his appointment, his very promising beginning, but of course his later folly and sin. It's going to be kind of interesting since you know we'll be moving towards October. One of the interesting things to focus on as we get to Halloween is to understand the story of the Saul and the witch at Endor because it's one of those very, very interesting passages, but also it lends itself to, among other things, you know, a high school play or something for the, around the Halloween season. It's a great project, actually. But anyway, then, of course, David, the greatest of the kings, will occupy the last half of this book, and uh, on we go. So we're in 1 Samuel 4, 5, and 6 tonight. In 1 Samuel 4, the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Here's Samuel, last of the judges, but he's now established, uh, he is... He gives the word to the nation. This is the first of the judges. He's the last of the judges, but he's the first judge really to speak to the nation as a group. Most of what we saw in the book of Judges were regional deliverers that rose up for certain specialized occasions. But whereas in the book of Judges we dealt with uh, the Ammonites to the east, we had a few of the chapters with Samson, so we talk about the Philistines to the west, the south and the west, were an area called Philistia. And uh, they're tough dudes, because they have the technology of iron in their weaponry. And that was a technological advantage of great significance. And that's why they prohibited any other metal workers or smiths throughout the land to to maintain that dominance. And so, uh, but anyway, Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer, that's a town, and we'll show you a map in a minute, and uh, the Philistines pitched at Aphek. Aphek was just on the Philistia, on their side of the border. Ebenezer just on the Israeli side of the border. If you visualize a band along the coast, uh, the seaward side being the Philistines, they actually came originally from Egypt, then to Crete, uh, but they're uh, uh, very closely akin to the Phoenicians. They're seagoing people uh, and with a technological skill aptitude. But anyway, the Philistines, verse 2, put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. And that's a rough loss. It's not as large as some of the losses we're going to see, but it's a, it obviously was a huge setback. And when the people came into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? 
Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. Now here is one of the fundamental problems Israel had. They're treating the ark like the pagans might, that it's some kind of magical artifact, that it somehow is going to save them. They're looking to the ark, not to God. You'd think they could connect the dots and figure out that for some reason God is upset. Had they sought God's leading before they attacked the Philistines? No evidence of that in the text. They did it on their own, and they got clobbered. You'd think they'd figure out that uh, it's time to seek the Lord. Not treat the Ark of the Covenant of some kind of talisman or fetish. or a, It's almost an attitude towards the Ark that's analogous to pagan mysticism. The Ark is at this time at Shiloh, so they're going to bring it out. And uh, so the people went to send to Shiloh, verse 4, that they might bring from thence the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. You may recall, of course, from the previous session, that these two sons of Eli are bad news. They're hooligans. They're using the office of the priest to shake down people, to rob from them, to commit adultery with the women. And these are, these are bad dudes. It's very ironic that Eli, who was a godly man, had sons that were such losers. Samuel, who's the hero of this uh, section of the Scripture, is a godly man. In fact, he's, some people reckon him only se- second only to Moses in stature in the Old Testament because he's going to anoint the first king and he's also going to anoint David. He's, you know, he has a key role. So Samuel's a good guy. And yet his sons are losers. And one of the things you can kick around in your study groups is to kick around, you know, why is it that godly parents can have children that are not godly? What's the, where's their failing? And that, that should generate a lot of discussion. Now, you understand how discussion groups work where two people agree one is unnecessary. And you, say, you want to have a little dialogue there. Okay. By the way, you'll probably notice that in our notes for our commentaries, we're always including what we call a little study guide after each session that has three sections. Study questions, just questions about what we've talked about. Discussion questions, which have, don't necessarily have a right or wrong answer. It's just a, issues to raise in a group. And the third one is some research project for the really diligent that they can go. The rabbit trails that I leave loose out, they, we leave those for the, as research items in the study notes. Anyway, uh, getting to verse 5, And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. So they're feeling great. They've been clobbered badly, but now they got the Ark. Everything's going to be great. They're in for a very unpleasant surprise, of course. Think through the mistakes they're making. Why is Israel in error here? Well, because they're looking at some kind of mysticism rather than seeking God and His leading. And before we get too critical of them, let's examine our own lives. How often do we do that? How often do we indulge in some form of pagan mysticism ourselves, consciously or unconsciously? You know, I'm not sure that you could say that the Israelis knew that they were, you know, rejecting God by this. Quite the contrary. They probably had really good feelings. They're Confusing form with substance here. But uh, uh, one other thing before I leave verse 4. It speaks of the Lord of hosts which dwelleth between the cherubims. Now this is uh, out of the King James, and you probably, most of you know enough Hebrew to catch the error there. The word cherubim is plural without the S. Cherub is singular, cherub. But certain Hebrew words with, that have I-M endings, the I-M is the plural of it. Cherub, cherubim. When you say cherubims, uh, it has this. It should have the same ring in your ears. When people come up to me or, on, or when they call in on radio things, they have question about Revelations. See, if they've studied the Book of Revelations, I know they haven't heard any of our commentaries or they've never studied it seriously. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, singular. Well, here also, in this case again, it's a it's a, a clumsy editorial issue, but it, I think you'll find it that way in your King James. But the main point of reason I bring it up: God is over several dozen times 
referred to or designated as he that dwelleth between or technically above the cherubim. It's a preposition that can mean either. One of the things, if you haven't studied it, I encourage you to do a careful study of the mercy seat, the seat of mercy. You may recall we have the Ark of the Covenant. We have seven pieces of furniture in the tabernacle. We have the, uh, the uh, brazen altar. That's where you start with the altar of sacrifice. You have the labor where the priests washed. And then you enter this portable building called the, the tabernacle proper. And in there to the left you have the menorah, the, the seven branch candlestick, and to the right you have the table of showbread. And in front of, associated with, but just outside of the Holy of Holies, you have the golden altar. Don't confuse it with the brazen altar. That's the altar of sacrifice. The golden altar is a little thing about three feet high, a foot square. That's an incense altar. It's right in front of the veil that separates the holy place from the Holy of Holies. Inside the Holy of Holies, you have two things. Not one, two. See, up to now we've, we've, had, uh, we've had the brazen altar, the laver, the menorah, the table of showbread, and that golden altar. You've got five things. You've got two more. The Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat. All of us fall into the trap or presupposition. We treat, it, we treat the Mercy Seat like the lid of the Ark. Uh, it's not. It's very different. It's always spoken of separately in the Scripture. Yes, it sits on top of the Ark. It serves sort of a lid in a sense. But the ark is made of wood covered with gold. The ark speaks of Jesus Christ. In the, the, when you, the, the tabernacle itself was wood covered with gold, these planks, on silver sockets. That speaks of his humanity and yet his deity. And it rests on silver, which is a symbol of blood. It rests on the blood. When you go in the Holy of Holies, you see the Ark of the Covenant, which has the testimony, the, you know, the tables of stone and so forth. But the mercy seat is different. It's solid gold. And it's adorned with these two cherub, cherubim. Um, and God is always spoken of as sitting between or above those cherubim. At least idiomatically, they, they visualize God sitting there. On the one hand, and the whole purpose of all of this was so that God could dwell among his people. And there was a cloud. The, the Shekinah glory was uh, hovered over all of this. Out of that cloud, audibly, he spoke to Moses. Once a year, the high priest, after great ceremonial preparation, was the only time he could enter there, and again, to, to sprinkle the blood. But when you study that carefully in the Old Testament, you notice that he sprinkles the blood on and in front of the mercy seat. And it's interesting, it, the picture that's being painted, if you put all those texts together, it's almost as, as it's painting a picture as if God is sitting there. Because the, in front, there's a reference to the soles of his feet. I'm not saying he's anthropomorphic and sitting there, but that's, that's the picture that's painted. Now, one of the things that is worth your consideration is that the mercy seat may have a prophetic role. The mercy seat may indeed be in Ethiopia. And uh, we're going to go there in January and take a look if we can. The, uh, if, if the mercy seat is in Ethiopia, they say the ark, but the ark's not the important part. The important part's the mercy seat. Because it may be the seat from which he rules in the millennium. And that's probably what Acts 8 is all about with the Ethiopian treasure who has gone to Jerusalem. See, the Ethiopians know what they have there to deliver to the Messiah in Zion. That's their whole belief system even today. The legends they have by which they got it are disprovable, but everybody overlooks the fact that there's another path in the scripture by which it probably got there. But the point is, is that uh, if the treasurer was there, to ch he went there to check out, heard the Messiah is there, he gets there and he finds out he's been killed. He's, coming, he's going back home confused. And if you read Isaiah 52 and 53, that was what he's reading in his chariot, which says that someone's going to have to explain all this to you. Philip comes up, do you understand? No, how can I explain? Unless you and Philip, of course, uh, taken out, miraculously taken out of a revival in Samaria, brought down there for this guy to straighten him out, he, and he preaches to him. He explains that the Messiah had to be killed. He's going to come back. Can I be you know, uh, baptized? Absolutely. So they take care of him and so forth. And he heads back home. What's not in the scripture, but it's my conjecture. I think he went back to the Queen Candace and says, not yet. Not yet. Yes, the Messiah's there, but he's going to return. And they're still waiting. So we'll see. And uh, if you haven't gotten through this material, I encourage you to take a look at our briefing package called The Seat of Mercy, which... Uh, uh, has some interesting uh, possibilities. But anyway, moving on, 
When the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so the earth rang again. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the Ark of the Lord was come into the camp. I want you to picture yourself as these Philistines. They've heard about Egypt. They've heard about the disasters that fell upon Pharaoh, how these, these people were miraculously delivered from the Egyptians. They've heard about how Joshua, a generation ago, took him across the Jordan the same way, with the waters parting and so forth. They've heard the stories of Jericho and all the rest of it. Verse 7, the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. These guys are shook for good reason, because they knew the history. They may not know all the details, but they've heard enough to strike terror in their souls. And yet, they're interesting guys, because they go on, Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. But then listen to, listen to the pep rally here. Be strong and quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews for they have been to, as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. You know, you have to be impressed with the guts, the resolve of these Philistines. Yes, they had some technological advantages. And yes, they were professional warriors. But they had good reason to be terrified of what's going on here. Because for all they know, now that the ark's among them, they could be in for some very unpleasant surprises. And I, 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 I have to admit that from verse 9, I'm intrigued. These guys have the guts even to keep going on here. But they do, and the, the Philistines fought, verse 10, and Israel was smitten. And they fled every man into his tent, and there was a very great slaughter, and there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. Almost 10 times what they lost before. Lost 4,000 before, now they got 30,000. And here is the big blow. And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. Some bad news and some good news, in a sense, I suppose. The ark of God was taken. That has to be a huge blow for Israel. And God is making a point. Their hope should not be in the ark. Their hope should be in the God of the covenant. And not to confuse the form with the substance. The fact that uh, Eli's sons were killed is, uh, is, is something that probably, because what, what you know about them, we don't particularly grieve over them except too bad they didn't repent before they died. But there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army, and he came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent and with earth upon his head. Now, he's gone back to Shiloh where the ark came from, and there in Shiloh, of course, is the tabernacle, and that's where Eli, the priest, was. And when he came, lo, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart was trembled for the ark of God. So Eli naturally was concerned because the ark was out of the tabernacle, it's gone to war, he was concerned for the ark. It's interesting that this messenger out of the tribe of Benjamin doesn't go to Eli, he goes right by him to the city. That's kind of interesting. And when the man came into the city, he told it, and all the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the crying, see he's out of town, he's on the wayside there, he hears the crying, he said, what meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the man came in hastily and told Eli. I think it's interesting that he told the people first and then the priest. You know, that sort of implies that Eli didn't have quite the, the swag or the clout that uh, you'd think that he would deserve being the key priest there. But um, Now, Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were dim so that he could not see. So you can probably regard him as sort of in some form of a semi-retirement, perhaps. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. And he said, What is there done, my son? He wants the news. The messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines. And there hath been also a great slaughter among the people. And thy two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. And the ark of God is taken. Forced four main messages, probably in the order of significance to the messenger. 
that Israel's fled. There's been a great slaughter. Eli's two sons are killed. And that might have been the reason he passed Eli. He didn't want to face that right now. Came back and told him. And the ark of God is taken. It came to pass when he made mention of the ark of God that he, that's Eli, fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate and his neck was broken. And he died, for he was an old man and heavy. And he had judged Israel forty years. Now his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. So the, the joy of having a son is more than clouded by the fact that she's lost her husband and her father-in-law, and Israel has lost the ark. So she says she named the child Ichabod. I don't think any, anybody named Ichabod in here? Your parents did not do that to you? Good for you. Um, she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken because her father-in-law and of her husband. She said, The glory is departed from Israel, the ark of God is taken. I don't know many Ichabods. The only Ichabod I know is Washington Irving's colorful character in Sleepy Hollow, probably very aptly named. Let's move on to chapter 5. The Philistines took the ark of God, and their troubles are just beginning. <laughs> Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer, to Ashdod. Ebenezer is on the Israel side. They got to Ebenezer. They went to Ephek and then down. I'll show you the map in a minute. To, to Ashdod, which is one of the five Philistine cities. Understand when you talk about the Philistines, there are five primary cities, and that's going to be prominent in the, in the narrative here. Now, you remember uh, Samson played all kinds of shenanigans on these guys. When Philistines took the Ark of God, they brought it to the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. <laughs> I love this. And when they of Ashdod rose early in the morning, in the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. I don't think the symbolism was lost in these guys. You know, they're superstitious pagans, and this it's not likely just attributed this to maybe an earth tremor or something. They understood this was not good news. They took Dagon and set him in his place again. Can you imagine worshiping a God that you have to help get on his feet again? I mean, really, you know. So, Dagon uh, was, has been worshipped before the 20th century B.C., two millenniums, in other words, three millenniums ago. He's actually considered the storm god, and sometimes by some of the sea god. He's also regarded as the grain or fertility god. The word dag means fish. Daga means to multiply or increase and grow. Really, uh, the concept of fertility is, underlies this. He is regarded by them as the father of Baal. He's represented uh, typically as half man, half fish by both the Phoenicians and the Philistines, which are closely akin, and also by Nineveh, by the way. Uh, we have various uh, renderings of him. There are temples in Gaza, Ashdod have been found, Beth Shan, and uh, Beth Dagon in Judah in Joshua 15 in the tribe of Asher, Joshua 19. So they're around. And Nineveh. Let's remember that Nineveh worshipped Dagon. And that gives you a whole different perspective when you see Jonah come to town, probably bleached from having been in the stomach of a whale for three days. That gave an authority perhaps very unique to the Ninevites. But in any case, uh, let's move on. When they arose early in the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off from the threshold, and only the stump of Dagon was left to him. You know, you think they'd get the message, something strange is going on here. The word threshold, by the way, can also mean pedestal. So there's debates as to what that really means. But the next verse 5 says, Therefore neither the priests of Dagon nor any that came into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. So the, the echoes of this continued long after the event. But obviously, uh, what they're beginning to realize is the hand of the Lord is heavy upon them of Ashdod. And the reason will become clear in the subsequent verses. But in addition to what you're seeing here with the Dagon falling on his face in front of the ark, and then the next day having not only fallen, but having himself dismembered, the Lord apparently also sent plagues of rats. It's translated mice, but it really should be rats. 
in your text. They also had a plague of what your more polite modern translations may call tumors. But the original Hebrew is a little more explicit. It's what you and I would call hemorrhoids. Now, anyway, the men of Ashdod saw that it was so. They said, the ark of God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon our God. They're beginning to realize that they're up against something greater than the God that they're worshiping. That's got to be a real blow, by the way. We can be glibly and we can be cute about it, but it must be shattering for someone who's put their trust and commitment in a false god. And uh, in our in our culture, we don't see people worshiping Dagon particularly, but we see people worshiping just the same stupidity. We've invented in our culture the most insulting god of all. For the Philistines to attribute the creation or whatever else to Dagon is offensive, of course, to the living God, the creator of the universe. But you know what's even more offensive? Then look at the creation and ascribe it to nothingness. It came from random accidents. That's the most insulting of all. To ascribe the creation skill and engineering to somebody other than the living God is insulting. But to indicate that it's not even necessary is, is, is irrational to the extreme, provably so. And yet that is the foundational belief in our entire culture. Not just in our biological sciences, but in our laws, in our, in our whole culture, this whole evolutionary hypothesis. It's tragic that we can't administer in our culture evidence-based education. We have to go to tradition-based education in our presumably enlightened culture. Anyway, these the Philistines are shook up, and they, they sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines unto them, and said, what shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They want to get rid of this thing. They're not stupid. They answered, let the ark of God be carried about unto Gath. See, the first thing, <laughs> that's great for Ashdod. Send it down to Gath, or Ekron, or, or, or uh, you know, Ashkelon. Get it out of our town. <laughs> so they carried the ark of God of Israel about thither, that is to Gath. And it was so that after they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great, and they had, excuse the expression, hemorrhoids in their secret parts. (laughs) Does that make it a little clearer? Now, by the way, in the Masoretic text, they often find what they think is an error. They'll call it a kathiv, and then marginally put a kiri, the, the correction. You know, the value of pi shows up in the, in the uh, Second Kings 7.23 as an example by understanding that. We talked about that before. It's in our stuff. In this case here, what you'll find as a kiri, as a marginal correction, the Hebrew word pekor, which means tumors in general. But if you look at the Masoretic, the, the, the kathiv is ofel, and it's clearly, more specifically, hemorrhoids. The Masoretes were dealing here with a euphemism. They felt that was perhaps a little offensive to the sensitive readers. But um, they've got tumors then in their secret parts. Whatever, okay. Um, first, <laughs> first Samuel 5, verse 10. Therefore, they sent the ark of God to Ekron. <laughs> Gath didn't want it either, see? So it came to pass that the ark of God came to Ekron. The Ekronites cried out saying, They have brought about the ark of God to us to slay us and our people. They don't want this thing. Get it out of town. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of God to Israel and let it go again to its own place, that it slay us not in our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. The men that died not, many apparently died, were smitten with the hemorrhoids, and the sky of the city went up to heaven. Some uh, commentators noticed that this may be the first recorded instance where rats are associated with disease, like the bubonic plague. Because there are, two, there are two plagues that are on top of these guys. The rats and these hemorrhoids, or boils, whatever. They may, may not be hemorrhoids. As we think of them, they may be far more widespread. I mean, we, we could be glib about it, but we don't really know. Um, but they really want this thing taken care of. So to give you a feeling of the geography, here is a map of Israel that we use in the book of Judges. You recall, I put the outline of the current state to give you a flavor of this. I'll get rid of that. And the Philistines are all along the coast there. Uh, And so I'll take that up to keep the thing from getting too confused. 
And if you'll notice these five cities, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, Gath, those are the five cities and the five lords, if you will, of the, of the Philistines. The uh, tabernacle starts at Shiloh and goes to Ebenezer, which is roughly on the boundary of uh, Israel before, facing the Philistines. But the Philistines succeed. They take it to Aphek and then down to Ashdod. And that's where we have the first encounter with the rats and the, uh, and the hemorrhoids and so forth. And the Ashdod guys want it out of town, so they move it to Gath. Gath wants it out of town, goes to Ekron. Now we can infer from the text, by the way, that does not mean that Ashkelon and Gaza were exempt because all five lords are complaining about the rats and the hemorrhoids. We're now in 1 Samuel 6. The ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners saying, What shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to its place. Okay, we're going to send it back. How do we go about it? Nobody wants to volunteer <laughs> to do this thing. And uh, they said, if we send away the ark of the God of Israel, send it not empty, but in any wise return him a trespass offering. Then ye shall be healed and it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. That's the advice of their priests. That's good advice. That turns out to be good advice. You know, one of the questions that you can't help but come up is, it's strange the Lord didn't just wipe them all out. He obviously had a lot of them die. But we do have a merciful God. We do have a merciful God. Then said they, what shall be the trespass offering, which we shall return to him? <laughs> they answered, well, we'll make five golden hemorrhoids and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. Now, see, there's five lords, five major cities, five major lords. They're going to, give five, they're going to make five golden mice. I can visualize that. You know, if you've got a, a, you know, a metal smith, you can make a golden, you know, five golden mice. That works. But how do you make five golden hemorrhoids? <laughs> how do you find the guy that's going to pose as the model? I, 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 don't, I have a trouble with it. Every time, every time I go through this, I crack up because you, know, you can read the text unless you stop and think about and try to visualize what's going on. Um, anyway, let's move on. Wherefore you shall make images of your hemorrhoids. <laughs> and images of your mice that mar the land. And ye shall give glory unto the God of Israel. Ooh, there's the key point. And ye shall give glory unto the God of Israel. Peradventure he will lighten his hand from off of you and from off your gods and from off your land. This is coming, apparently, from the Philistine leadership. This is good advice. Wherefore then do ye harden your hearts as the Egyptians of the Pharaoh hardened their hearts? When he had wrought wonderfully among them, did they not let the people go? And they departed. Now therefore make a new cart, take two milk kine, cows in other words, on which there hath come no yoke, these are unbroken I guess, huh? And tie the kine to the heart and bring their calves home from them. In other words, take the calves from them. If you, how are you going to deal with an unbroken cow that has had its calf removed? These are not going to be docile animals. They're going to be angry, you'd think, but they're not. Take the ark of the Lord, lay it up on the cart, Put the jewels of gold, which ye return him for a trespass offering, in a coffer by the side thereof, and send it away that it may go. It's interesting, apparently, they didn't lift the lid and look in. Why do I say that? It's not in the text. You'll see why in a few verses. Take the ark of the Lord, lay it upon the cart, put the jewels of gold, jewels, <laughs> the mice and the hemorrhoids in gold, put them in, the, in this uh, coffer or box next to it, by the side thereof, and send it away that it may go. And if it, see, it, if it goeth by the way of its own coast to Beth Shemesh, then he hath done us this great evil. Meaning God has done this. If not, then we shall know that it was not his hand that smote it, it was just chance that happened to us. See, what they're really asking for is what's, what's in the form of a miracle. Will these unbroken cows take this to where it should go? That the nearest, the nearest Israeli town, apparently, is Beth Shemesh. And if so, we know that God, it's God that has been doing all this to us. If somehow they do something else, they wander off aimlessly, then we know this was just, you know, there was no connection between the, the uh, ark and all their, their troubles. The men did so. They took two milk kine, tied them to the cart, shut up their calves at home. They laid the ark of the Lord upon the cart. I'm surprised the guys that handled it didn't get killed. But see, they're not, they're not in a covenant relationship. 
and the coffer with the mice of gold and the images of the emeralds. He put it all in the cart. And the kind took the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh and went along the highway, lowing as they went, and turned not aside to the right or the left. In other words, they went right where they're supposed to. And the lords of the Philistines went after them unto the border of Beth Shemesh. This is to give you a rough feeling of the, you know, we, we followed from Shiloh of Ebenezer to Aphek to Ashdod to Gath to Ekron. Now we're going to Beth Shemesh where an incident occurs. They of Beth Shemesh were reaping their har- wheat harvest in the valley. They lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. And the ark came into the field of Joshua, a Beth Shemite. Don't confuse this with the Joshua several generations ago. It just happens to be yeah, his name. But anyway, he's a Beth Shemite. And he stood there and there was a great stone and they clave the wood of the cart, and they offered the kind a burnt offering to the Lord. In other words, they, they used the cart for the wood, and they took the two cows and, 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 and did a burnt offering. The Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the coffer that was with it, wherein the jewels of gold, <laughs> gold were, and put them on the great stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices the same day unto the Lord. And the, when the five li- lords of the Philistines uh, had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. I can't help but wonder when the Levites looked in this box with the offerings, the, the, the jewels, how they could figure out what was in there and why. The mice they could probably figure out, you know. But I have no idea, you know, what else they were looking at or what conclusions they might have been coming to. Anyway, move on. These, uh, and these are the golden hemorrhoids which the Philistines returned for a trespass offering to the Lord, for Ashdod one, for Gaza one, for Ashkelon one, for Gath one, and for Ekron one. And the golden mice, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines, belonging to the five lords, both of the fence cities and of the country villages, even unto the great stone of Abel, whereon they set down the ark of the Lord, for which stone remaineth unto this day in the field of Joshua the Bethshemite. The great stone of Abel. Interesting thing to research. Every time I see his name, I'm always reminded. Everybody always asks, where did Cain get his wife? I don't know why that, you know, on a call, talk, call-in show, there's always somebody, where did Cain get his wife? I don't understand the problem. He married his brother's sister because he was able. It's pretty straightforward. No? 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 Okay, sorry. Let's go on. Um, see, there's no telling what you learn at these Bible studies. Verse 19, and he smote the man of Bethshemesh. Uh-oh. He smote the men of Bethshemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote of the people 50,000 threescore and ten men. And the people lamented because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. Now let me quickly add, most scholars believe that there is a textual error here because they use the letters in the Hebrew for numbers, and a very a few subtle changes can change the number. And many people, many scholars, think that this is a scribal error because they can't visualize 50,000 guys looking into this box. So what you'll find in many commentaries, or the assumption at least, and I didn't uh, dig into all the justifications, but it's, it's widely held among some of the experts, that there's actually three score and ten, not 50,000 three score and ten. And so that's a view and uh, not a critical thing. But be aware that there are, uh, in our translation in the Masoretic text, there are a number of places where there are variants between the Masoretic and the Septuagint. And there's also some, you know, some um, what they call autographical, original uh, copyist problems. We believe that the Bible is inerrant in the original. But it obviously has suffered somewhat in uh, the recopying and translations. The good news is you can go through all of those and find no doctrinal issues. There are things like this where there's a question of exactly what the number was, fine, but it's not a a doctrinal point, you follow what I'm saying? But at least be aware of it. And the men of Bethshemah said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall he go up from us? And they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kiriath-Jerim, saying, The Philistines have brought again the ark of the Lord. Come ye down and fetch it up to you. So obviously the Philistine, the uh, Levites will come down from Kiriath-Jerim and they'll carry it on their shoulders, not on a cart, on their shoulders to Kiriath-Jerim. If we go to, uh, and that of course is, is uh, to the northeast of uh, Beth Shemesh. And it will stay there some at least 20 years. 
Just to take a quick peek at chapter 7, we'll get into it next time, but just a quick glimpse. The men of kiriath Jerim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord, and they brought it to the house of Abinadab on, in the hill and sanctified Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass while the ark abode in kiriath Jerim, the time was long, for it was 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. God's making a number of points in this lesson, just to wrap it up. We don't trifle with God. He gave them rules. The first mistake was to presume on their own plans without seeking the Lord or His counsel and to compound that problem to rely on a fetish or a form of mysticism as a justification or they're putting, putting their hope in, a, in an artifact, really, treating the ark as if it's an artifact. Now, the ark is not to be trifled with. The Philistines certainly found that out, and the men of Beth Shemesh found that out to their pain. David is going to get a very painful lesson in that area when he, uh, one of his early uh, encounters. God means what he says and says what he means. God takes himself very seriously. We need to learn from this uh, that we need to too. We may not be facing issues of the Ark of the Covenant, but we face the same issues every day. When you have a plan or a commitment or taking on a project, do you seek the Lord first? Do you look for His confirmation? In His Word? In, in, in godly counselors? Remember Psalm 1? Do we fall into the trap of looking upon artifacts with some kind of imputed mystical value? It's very difficult because we have memorabilia. There are things that remind us of the past and that we treasure for various nostalgic reasons. But let's be very, very careful that we don't do this, make the same mistake the Israelis did, um, thinking that God would deliver a victory to them. It was their plan, not God's. We need to remember that when we pray. Our prayer is not a mechanism to manipulate God. See, the Israelis were trying to manipulate God. We're going to take the ark. He's going to have to give us victory. Oh, really? Prayer is not your opportunity to manipulate God. Prayer is God's way of enlisting you in what He wants to do. Your search is to find out what He wants to do. Now, indeed, you pray for the sick. and there's a many. He has instructed us to bring a number of things to His feet. And we should remember, we have a 24-hour hotline to the throne room of the entire universe. It's open to every one of us. 24-7. And he's anxious to hear. We need to use it more often. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.